It's time for Clemson Sports Talk with Lawton Swan. Just call me Swanee. Tiger style. Tiger style. The Southland and out of the gate, former Clemson Tiger head coach Tommy Bowden joins us in a special weekend up in Tiger Town as Clemson will honor his father's legacy. And for Tommy, it'll be his first trip back inside Death Valley on the field, at least. There's speculation about whether he's actually been back. We'll find out from uh, the former Clemson Tiger head coach right here on the show. And I want to let you know, Coach Bowden's traveling actually today up to Clemson. So we recorded this last night and Coach, so let's put the let's put the conversations to rest. Have you been in Death Valley at all since your final uh, days as the head coach there back in two thousand and eight? No, you know I, I haven't. But uh, I worked for guys for about nine years. I worked on Saturdays during the fall. You know, up in Charlotte, we had a live studio show, so never had the opportunity. And it seems like as soon as I got through with TV, my father's health uh, started going south pretty quick. You know, so I, I spent a lot of time in Tallahassee, and I've got aging in-laws. And, uh, so I uh, have not been back, but really looking forward to it. Well, I tell you, you know this from your seven, eight years with us here on the program. I've talked about it for a long time, and, you know, I just feel like it's the right thing to do. So I'm glad it's happening. I, I hate the circumstances that it's happening uh, under with your father passing away this past year. And, uh, you know, but – for, for these teams across the league and Clemson specifically to honor your dad certainly has to mean not just a lot to you, but to Terry and the rest of your family members as uh, your dad's legacy obviously extended well beyond uh, the realm of Dope Campbell Stadium and the Florida State football family. Yeah, you know, my, my mother was really honored. Uh, dad, though, you know, initially asked me uh, at the funeral, uh, we were, he was came to see my mother and family in a little private room we had uh, right before the f- service and uh, extended the invitation at that time uh, in front of, with the, along with the AD, uh, Dan Radakovich. So, uh, like I said, that's, it's something that Dab initiated and put together. And my family is appreciative for that because. You know, Clemson has won national, you know, back in 81, won that national championship. Then it has won two since then. And it is, they are now the Florida State of, of when I took the Clemson job. So uh, a lot of uh, kind of unusual circumstances that have gone on since, since that time has elapsed. Again, Tommy Bowden with us here on the program. And so, Coach, uh, you know, I'm thinking about, you mentioned last week your relationship uh, with Dabo Sweeney. He brought up, this week, or he was asked about the 2003 Bowden Bowl game. You guys had been beaten by Wake Forest, 45-17. I think you were actually down uh, 45 nothing in that game. And and still very early in your tenure, I guess, what, your fourth year there at Clemson, and uh, people were pretty angry about the way that went down. And there were, there were you know, kind of conversations that this might be it. And you guys are facing your father's team. They're undefeated. And uh, number three in the country, and you guys come out, and Charlie Whitehurst plays a phenomenal game. Derek Hamilton had a big touchdown in that one. Uh, what were your memories of that game from just the standpoint of a guy who probably, I mean, you probably know at that point that it's not going great and uh, to get your team up. But but Tim Beret said yesterday on the program, I talked to him on Thursday, he said that in the locker room after that Wake Forest game, you told those guys, hey, we're going to go beat Florida State next weekend. All that sound true to you oh yeah yeah I, I wasn't in just a little bit of trouble i was in a lot of trouble <laughs> so let's clarify that it was a <laughs> it was a big game there's, there's no doubt it uh, my, my tenure at clemson could have easily ended had i lost that florida state game i probably would have and probably been de- deserved but uh i remember you know going in the locker room after the wake forest game and you know being in a locker room small locker room guys are taking off the shoulder pads and I'm doing the Velcro on their, on their shoes. You know, it's, 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 there's not a lot of talking, but there's a lot of noise. 
So I had to be fairly vocal to get their attention. And I just told them, I said, emphatically, we will. We will win the game next week. I said, I promise you that. And uh, I, I remember Charlie Whitehurst making reference to that after the Florida State game when we won. And uh, the important thing after the Wake Forest games is that my players believed that we could beat Florida State. Uh, hmm. You know, I might not have believed it, <laughs> but the point is to get them to believe that they can win. So, uh, yeah, that was no doubt a, a pivotal point of the, that season. I think we won the rest of our games. And uh, it might have been the year we beat, maybe beat Tennessee, who was about was. 10 or 12 for the nation in, in the bowl game. So, uh, oh, I remember very vividly. I don't remember much about the Florida State game. I do remember more about the Wake Forest game, that locker rooms with it, that Charlie Whitehurst had mentioned where we – I told him, we said, we're going, we're going to win the game. And we started at that moment uh, trying to instill that into the players. I should have said that before the Wake Forest game. <laughs> before the Wake Forest game, we, we will beat Wake Forest. I said it the wrong game. <laughs> yeah, so, some things you just thought you didn't have to say, Coach. I get it. I think yeah, well, did. Hey, exactly. Yeah, you're thinking like uh, I was. So you're going to get fired, too, you think like that. Yeah. And well, I, I tell you the other that. thing, and, and I do want to circle back to one other thing out of that 2003 game. That was also the season you guys beat South Carolina 63-17, to 17, and that score just rolls off the tongue. I, I mean, I don't care. It's, it, you know, it's been, what, 18 years, and I, that's the price of a premium subscription on my website, Coach, $63.17. <laughs> it just makes Clemson fans feel good. They pump their gas. They, you know, if gas prices go up, and they can get it to sixty three dollars and seventeen cents. They'll pump it and take a picture. So that's also a lasting legacy from that year. So Dabo Sweeney was asked about this uh, as well, and he mentioned the fact that his first year on your staff. You know, you had gone and brought him in, and right. he was asked yesterday or Wednesday, I guess, if he would have maybe been out and he was building his house. And he said, "You know, I didn't come here to oh, rent." Yeah. And uh, the builder, do you know this story? Have you heard this? I, somebody, one of the reporters told me today that they said something about buying his house. Is that, that accurate? Well, yeah, the guy said, yeah, exactly. The uh, I, I can guess you probably talked to Larry Williams. That seems like the guy that would have probably gotten it. Yeah, no, I, wasn't, I, have, I have not talked to Larry, but somebody had, he must, Dabo must have told the story publicly because of, he did. Like it, it, and it, it was spectacular. And uh, the, the, the builder said, hey, look, if things don't go well, I got somebody that'll buy this house. And Dabo said, I just built the same house in Alabama. We're moving into this house. <laughs> and so, you know, thinking about that, and I, I know that you guys, the head coach and the coaching staff, you're, I, I don't want to say you're sheltered from the, the people in the community because you are out there, but what about the coaches' wives? Talk to us a little bit about, you know, what those moments are like for uh, your wife, Linda, or his wife, Kathleen, when things aren't going great. And, you know, she's got the, I don't know, the local chat and chew at the church or the supper club mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever they've got going on. I mean, how is that for the ladies that we don't see uh, behind the scenes in your estimation? Well, yeah, it's more difficult for not only the wives, but for the children that are in grade school or in high school or middle school or something. They, they catch it really bad. And I can remember in 1974, my father had his only losing season in West Virginia, and they, they, you know, they voted to, the board voted to either keep him or let him go, and it was like a uh, two to two vote, and the, the president voted to keep him one one more year. But you you're exposed to that as a child or as a wife, and you know, it's my wife going to the grocery store or PTA meeting or shopping. You know, the, here's the 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 public ridicules. So you're right, coaches are sheltered and don't hear it, but it's hardest. Uh, like uh, right now, be the Sweeney boys in class. You know, in college, I think you've got a couple of them there going to yeah. college or Kathleen out shopping or, or going to the grocery store or something like that. that. Those are the ones that's toughest. And coaches are isolated. They're in a cave all day and go to bed and uh, go to go home, go to sleep, come back, right. and go back to work. Yeah, so it's it's toughest on the family. There's no doubt. I saw it firsthand with my father. Then my wife and children went through it like most coaches' children do. Yeah, yeah that's, what, that's what really makes you interesting. You've seen it on both sides. You've been the kid in that house and you've been the husband uh in that house you really have and the son i mean having to see it from your mom's side so again that's why we love these conversations uh with former clemson tiger head coach tommy bowden again the clemson tiger program will be honoring his father uh bobby bowden saturday during that clemson florida state game 
Uh, so many moments in the history of that game just uh, you know ring through the years, uh, the annals, so to speak, of college football, including uh, that punt Ruski game, which is one I know you and I have talked about quite a bit. I, I mean, did your dad have a better play call in his career than that one? I mean, 21-21, a minute and change left in the ball game. Uh, it, 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 did he ever have a more creative and better play call that you can remember from his time as a head coach? No, that's the one that that, that that most people remember. I think it made it in. Uh, I think that'll go down in college football, and not only in my father's yeah. uh, tenure or legacy, but in, in college football is one of the greatest gutsy calls you know, in, in college football. And, and but uh, yeah, that that that's the one that, uh, that that people remember, regardless whether you're on the West Coast or Northeast or Southwest or. A Florida State fan, a Clemson fan, people know that play. It's been played so many times on ESPN and other venues. Now, on the call that day for Florida State, uh, when it, it, it with the radio call was the legendary voice Gene Deckerhoff, who you know just does a tremendous job. Um, what kind of relationship do you know that your father and, and Gene had during their run of years together there? Oh, they were they were real close because they were, I think he was there practically my father's whole tenure, which is a, a long time. And yeah. of course, Gene has done NFL games along with the, the basketball. I'm probably, probably even done some baseball at Florida State. But, you know, and you develop a relationship. You're with those people so much through the good and the bad. And, uh, of course, my father was mostly good. But uh, uh, Jim Phillips, uh, when I was at Clemson, the Don, they, when he passed away, Don Munson, you know, uh, you know, they're, they're they're really really great allies of a head coach because when you do lose a game, you should have won. They they do a really good job of kind of transitioning <laughs> the, the 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 story uh, to the fans and to the media. But uh, the, the, those those people like Gene Beckerhoff are just tremendous. Uh, they become tremendous friends uh, other than just business partners. Yeah, and we talked the other week uh, about the pilots and the relationship you have there. But I would imagine those radio guys, because you're kind of around them after some of these games and you've got the coaches showing all that. I mean, is it a, a, a relationship where you almost feel like you might can open up to them more than maybe almost anybody? I mean, is, is that kind of how it can be? Well, you develop that kind of relationship because, you know, in coaching, you really don't – have a lot of friends because you don't spend a lot of time socializing. You, your time is spent recruiting or on the field or practice or in meetings. So, you know, it's p- people like uh, uh, your radio, your sports information director, like Tim Bure. I'm still really good friends with Tim Bure. And we talk a, a good bit. Uh, I think I'm going to go up uh, right before the game, and Tim and Don are going to have me on, on the radio up there before the game. So, uh, those are special relationships because, like I said, coaches they don't get out very much, so yeah. they do share personal stories and family stories with those people that they typically would not uh, tell and, uh, and and reveal. Again, Tommy Bowden with us here on the program. Yeah, and that's exactly what uh, Tim told us yesterday that you were going to be a part of that broadcast uh, at the beginning to kind of get things rolling with them up there in the booth. And you know, I, I think about that reception. I mean, obviously, a, a part of whatever the sounds are in Death Valley are going to be in respect to your father and his legendary career. But, you know, I, I think as the years have gone by, and certainly for our listeners here on my program, they they recognize how much value I know you added to the program. I mean, what do you have any expectations for that moment? I mean, have you kind of pictured it and played a, a, kind of a, a game prep, so to speak, of what it may be like? Well, I really don't know what the what they're going to do. What I'm well, probably, yeah. You know, as I think about that game, about that particular game, I mean, just the Florida State Clemson game. When I went to Clemson, uh, uh, Florida State, you know, uh, Florida State was the Clemson of, of present day. And then, as I, I look, I'm sure when I walk in that state, I'm going to think about the first time I played Florida State since they're playing each other. And, and my father, you know, uh, went undefeated that year. We had him 14 to three at the halftime. Father, son, first time they ever played night game, ESPN, bout bowl. Uh, and then the tribute to my father because, uh, like a lot of sons, the fact, the admiration for my father, very godly man, a great coach and Christian man. And so being down there at field will be a little emotional, but I think. 
uh, and uh, hopefully they don't say too much about it. I keep my composure, but uh, it'll be a very much time, I think, because I honor him. So much respect for Clemson, I do, and he did, he had uh, for Clemson and then the Florida State. So, uh, like I said, it's it's, it's going to be an emotional time. Now, Coach, in addition to you and your wife, Linda, um, both children also, Clemson graduates, going to be there as well, and your grandkids. I mean, mm-hmm. who all from the Bowden contingent is expected to be there? I got the most important member of my family will be in attendance, Bobby Bowden himself, my grandson, who's about eight oh, years wow. old, is coming up. So, But my my daughter lives, too, lives a little bit too far away, and I think her son's got some sports activities that weekend. But my son, Ryan, and his wife, Amy, uh, the Tennessee graduate, and then my two grandsons of, from their his family, but the one of Bobby Bowden will be there in person. So uh, it'll wow. be, uh, it should be a good time for, for all, at least all our family. Coach, I just got chill bumps thinking about that. That is pretty <laughs> cool. That is Bobby pretty Bowden cool. Bobby Bowden will be there. <laughs> wow. I've, I'm getting them the second time you said it. That's unbelievable. And I'm glad Ryan's <laughs> going to be able to make it over and, and certainly be a part of uh, this celebration. So, Let's talk a little bit about the game. Um, you, you know, neither of these two Dilfer's conversation about it. Um, but Dilfer says, look, Trevor Lawrence got worse at Clemson uh, and DJ <laughs> is getting worse at Clemson. And they pointed uh, to Brandon Streeter, the quarterback's coach, and said, I don't think the quarterback's coach is getting the job done at Clemson. Now, look, I know that you know Brandon, of course. It, you know, Are you surprised to hear that? I, I really am because here's the one thing surprised me, the guy, you know, here's a guy, Trent, he's got a pretty good name and played some pretty good football and has studied the game and watched the game and is supposed to be a great analyst. And all you have to do <laughs> is look at Brandon's resume. Look what he's done with some of those quarterbacks and the way they, the way they formed. And uh, uh, so uh, Trevor and even Trevor Lawrence, uh, was, did did uh, Brandon coach Deshaun one year or no years, or is it all, only Trevor Lawrence? I'll tell you this: when Tony and Jeff took over the coaching duties, that would have been 2014. So yeah, he would have. How long has Chad Morris? Yeah, Chad Morris has been gone about five. Yeah, years. Yeah, Morris hadn't? left the year before Clemson Mor- went on their runs. Years. So yeah, that's when then, that's when he took over. Yeah, so he was there for yeah. Deshaun's two runs to the national yeah. championship game and all that. Yeah, that was Brandon Streeter <laughs> coaching those guys and. Uh, and what he said about Trevor Lawrence going backwards, you know, teams don't invest uh, all that money into the number one pick in the draft on a guy that looks like he might be going backwards. So Brandon's resume is too impressive. I, I was kind of shocked that guy said that. It just doesn't make sense. I'm sure most coaches and people that really know football just kind of laugh that off. And they say, Brandon does too. Um, you know, his wife probably did, and we, we talked some about that. And I, you probably get offended, <laughs> but but Brandon, he hopefully he shook that off as nothing because that 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 was really an asinine statement by a guy as qualified as he is. Yeah, Dilfer, Dilfer said, "I'm sure I'll get a phone call about it." But yeah, you <laughs> never know. You never know with these guys, yeah. Coach. Yeah. Listen, safe travels uh, to you and the family up to Clemson. Uh, it's an exciting opportunity. I, I, I know for Clemson Tiger fans to see you. Uh, and I'm sure it's quite the honor, as you mentioned, for your family to have your father recognized at this game. Thank you so much for pouring into this program every week, and we can't wait to kind of get your reaction to this weekend's festivities and celebration of your father's life and legacy uh, up in Death Valley. Uh, give us something to talk about next week. Again, Coach Tommy Bowden here on the show, man. What a what an awesome moment and a great legacy. Tiger fans, get on your feet. Uh First, get on your feet for the legacy of Bobby Bowden and what he left to the sport, but also get on your feet and support Tommy Bowden because uh, without his vision for the West Zone and all of that and Dabo Sweeney, uh, you probably aren't hoisting those national championships in 2016 and 2018. We'll hit a quick break. Stay with us.
Clemson Sports Talk on a Friday afternoon again. Awesome to catch up with Tommy Bowden and and really, really incredible to have these, what, seven years now talking with him every Friday before Clemson football games. And, and I've tried to dial it up a little bit here lately just with giving you some insight into being a coach and being in uh, the limelight and in that arena, something that so few people uh, will ever know. But I certainly remember that 2003 game that Dabo Sweeney referenced. We played that audio for you yesterday and then uh, kind of getting back into it a little bit with Tommy Bowden there. You know, that game and, and the run that Clemson went on to end that season was really just phenomenal. And I think the the most telling thing, again, out, outside of upsetting a number three ranked Florida State team and sort of the ambiance of that night and then to go into Williams Bryce Stadium a couple of weeks later against Lou Holtz uh, in the South Carolina Gamecocks and just obliterate South Carolina the way Clemson did 63 to 17. I mean, I, I don't even know if Clemson loses the bowl game uh, against Tennessee if Tommy Bowden's in any sort of trouble because he essentially erased every ounce of bad vibes that may have been surrounding him after that horrific loss to Wake Forest simply by putting a 63 spot on South Carolina. And, and it's not like you won 63 to 56. You know, it's not like you won 63 to 35. I mean, it was a, a, just a spanking, so much so that being at that game as a fan, I was in the upper deck with the Clemson contingent. And literally, by the time I got to my seat and got decently comfy, you know, standing there at the beginning cheering them all, Clemson scored not once, but twice. I mean, it was that was a snowball rolling down a hill with a tank pushing it behind. And South Carolina had no answers. I remember looking back on it. I think their safeties were playing pretty wide on the hash marks. And Clemson just zipped them on the seam. And it was, I mean, it was one of those moments where you never forget where you are. And I can remember looking down from my seats because I was right at the edge near those turnstiles that South Carolina has in their stadium where the fans can walk up. And their fans were pouring out of the stadium in the first quarter. Now, I was in Death Valley, or excuse me, I was in Williams Bryce Stadium also in 1989, which was a 45 to nothing Clemson win uh, on the road there. Terry Allen, I think, got injured in that ball game. But I never will forget my sister took me to that game. And it was 45 to nothing at the end. And I can remember, I would have been 12 years old. I can remember essentially being able to pick where I wanted to sit and cheer as loud as I wanted to cheer. And there wasn't a game cut. You could have thrown a hand grenade in Williams Price Stadium in that 45 nothing game and not a game cut would have been would have been hit. I mean, those two games inside that venue what 14 years apart from one another were just obliterations. I mean, it was, whoo. I still think about the just how quickly Clemson jumped on South Carolina. And given the fact that just a few short weeks before that, they had been beaten handily by Wake Forest, is, uh, it's mind-boggling. And then to see that team go on and face off against the top 10, I think it was a sixth-ranked Tennessee team in the Peach Bowl, and beat them up pretty well. I And I know it was surprising for Tennessee fans. I mean, they were not expecting Clemson to show up and show out. But Clemson did in that game. That was back in the old Georgia Dome. And I can remember we were at, I think it was Jocks and Jill's. It's a little restaurant. It was right around the corner from the stadium before that game. And there were so many people. So many people. And and Clemson fans, 
you know, I think once they turned it on, I think Clemson fans were sort of feeling a little bit of resurgence with Tommy Bowden because I think the thing you have to remember still, when you hired Bowden in in 1999, he had been undefeated at Tulane, and his father was still uh, in the midst of an incredible run, and in, in that first year would win his second national title. So the Bowden brand and the Bowden name, which will be celebrated tomorrow in Death Valley, only got larger the first year Tommy Bowden was there at Clemson. Then, four years later, when he's on the hot seat, his dad's team is one of the best in the country, and you end up knocking them off in that game. That's the game radio was at the ball game. That was, uh, you know, Whitehurst and and Derek Hamilton and all those guys that we've mentioned this week. But when you do that, you certainly take another step forward towards, man, well, maybe he is the guy. And then you go on this crazy run. You finish nine and four, and you beat you know Tennessee, a, a, a top ten ranked team, in the Peach Bowl. And it's not to say that oh yeah, there's no doubt that you know it's not like people were walking around saying oh man, there's no doubt Clemson's going to win a national title under Tommy Bowden. But when you do that, the way Clemson did it, you gave them this glimmer of hope. And his and his name and his father's legacy and all of that still had to hold some weight for a lot of people, even back then. Eight zero three four five zero 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 eighty six. So I think in that those moments when Clemson went on that run, I think you saw the best side of what Clemson could be under Tommy Bowden, and that was a legitimate monster football program, almost a precursor to Dabo Sweeney in some respects. Like the way they played in those final four games of the regular season, the confidence, uh, just everything about that, if you look back on it and think about it, feels a lot like what you've seen recently from this Clemson team uh, under Dabo Sweeney. 803-450-0086, text line, phone line. It is the show that shakes the Southland. Clemson Sports Talk. Stay with us. Happy Friday and happy Halloween coming up this weekend. Hope you guys are safe if you go out and about with the family, the kids, uh, doing it up big Sunday. I hate that, man. Like, there's certain holidays that just need to be on Saturday. Uh, Halloween's one. And the Super Bowl, I know it's not a holiday, but it should either A, the Monday after be a holiday, or B, should be played on a Saturday. I mean, I can I can fix a lot of our problems in a year, a couple of them at least, with just that little tweak to the old calendar. You know, you, you do the old Halloween, quote, observed on the 31st, but have the trick-or-treating taking place on a Saturday. That's, that's getting the holiday J-O-B-D-O-N-E, the job done. All right, so, you know, Clemson at 4-3, feels like there's not a lot riding on this game per se. I mean, there's still like this, I think, outside chance that Clemson could get to the ACC championship. They'd still have to win out. You'd still have to have a a tiebreaker between Clemson, Miami, and, excuse me, Clemson, NC State, and Wake Forest. I mean, it, it, it would take a lot. But there is something to really play for. Clemson's attempting to win their 32nd consecutive home game in this matchup, which would extend the school record for the longest home winning streak and the longest home unbeaten streak in school history. It would also extend the nation's longest active home winning streak. Get this. Of the 132 players on Clemson's 2021 roster, 127 have never experienced a home loss in their Clemson career. That's right. Five players on this team the super seniors are the only players that have ever experienced a loss inside Death Valley. That loss, of course, coming at the hands of the Pitt Panthers, 43-42 back in 2016. So, yeah, you're in a weird spot at 4-3. and three, But what I'm starting to look at 
and, and think about it, at least from the standpoint of somebody who covers this Clemson Tiger team is can they not just continue to play at a high level, uh, which they've struggled with this year, but can they continue some of these incredible streaks that have come along with the incredible run that they've been on? Both losses this season in league play have been on the road and, of course, losing to Georgia on a neutral site in the season opener. Clemson has three games remaining at home and could potentially push this streak out to 34 games by the end of the season. They've got matchups against Connecticut and Wake Forest at home remaining. Also, a road contest at Louisville next weekend, and then to close up the regular season, a road matchup at South Carolina. So for everybody who's kind of been you know, in and out on this team this year with the way things have been, especially offensively, there is still the there are I should say still these streaks that exist that you you kind of want to keep alive. Here's another one. Clemson also has a chance to become the first school to defeat Florida State in Atlantic Coast Conference play in six consecutive games. Currently, the Tigers have a five game winning streak, and it should have been six because I think everybody believes Clemson would have walloped and and just knocked around Florida State last year down in Tallahassee, but instead a singular COVID-19 case kept that one from happening, and Clemson now not playing all that well. Uh, it'll certainly be a, a tight matchup, I think, and we'll give our prediction coming up a little later in the program, but you know, just think about uh, this rivalry and what it's meant for so many years. Uh, and again, Florida State kind of came into the league, snatched the crown off of Clemson's head, had a tremendous run, eventually overtakes the Tigers in ACC championships, and then Clemson bounces back now with Dabo Sweeney having won six consecutive and seven uh, out of the last ten are your Clemson Tigers Atlantic Coast Conference championships, and Clemson's now back in front uh, in that regard. Now, they're not the only team, Clemson is not the only team uh, to ever beat Florida State uh, six consecutive times in the Atlantic Coast Conference. Uh, but Miami is in the league, but didn't do it while in the league, if that makes any sense. Miami beat them, uh, beat Florida State six consecutive times from 2000 to 2004, including a bowl game. Uh, but only the final game of that streak happened while Miami was in the ACC. 803-450-0086, 803-450-0086. And talk about a streak that's likely to come to an end. How about the winner of this game? has won the Atlantic Coast Conference Championship in nine out of the last 10 years. The only time that didn't happen was back in 2020 after this game was canceled. So technically, in 10 out of 10 seasons, uh, the team that either you know won this game or whatever you would call what happened a year ago has gone on to win the championship in the league, not national. I better, I better clarify, Alabama fans' ears just perked up. What? What championship? So, again, for Clemson, uh, just a, a lot on the line this Saturday. Uh, I think simply from the standpoint of the expectations of how good this team can be is certainly still out there and on the line. I think everybody's like, prove it at this point, and they haven't been able to. And I, I think I'll stick with what I've said all along. I think if they have one great game, I do believe that can change the tenor and, and and the the direction of this program this season. It for whatever reason, stress, pressure, uh, competition, believing that your nose is bloody so they can get after you. Whatever the reason, Clemson has just continued to make baffling and and mind blowing mistakes. I, I think if they clean that up and hit on a couple of big play big plays. Not only could they beat anybody they've played, that's obvious. But all of a sudden, I, I think they could look like one of the best teams in the country. The problem is we haven't seen anything to convince us that that will be the case or that that should be the case. 803-450-0086, text line, phone line. Again, it is the show that shakes the Southland Clemson Sports Talk rolling along on a Friday afternoon. We come back. 
the thinning of the Clemson running back room. We'll touch on that and much more here on a Friday afternoon. You're locked into the show that shakes the Southland. Stay with us here for more Clemson Sports Talk on Fox Sports Radio. On a Friday afternoon, the show that shakes the Southland, Lawton Swan with you again. I, I am hopeful, crossing my fingers, we'll be back live with the video uh, on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter this coming week. That is that is my hope. We don't have as many soccer games, so I'm not going to have to do as much traveling. I am hopeful that we can get that done for you. Now, the Clemson running backs, it is, it is a thin, thin situation at this point. Uh, with Kobe Pace being out due to being in the COVID-19 protocol, that means Will Shipley and Phil Maffa, the two freshman running backs, true freshmen, uh, will be 1A and 1B against Florida State. And additionally, the backup to those guys is the former walk-on Darian Rencher. Now, somebody said, somebody texted me yesterday and said, Swanee, why do you keep referring to Darian Rencher as a scholarship football player? And I looked, I couldn't find who messaged me that. But the reason I keep bringing that up is because he is a scholarship football player. He is. Darian Rencher has a scholarship right now at Clemson. He is a former walk-on with a scholarship. We kind of went through that list the other day talking about the, the situation where I said maybe the Sweeney boys and even the Venables boys. You know, maybe if you want to have an opportunity to take advantage of the transfer portal with little to no risk, then maybe your coaches who make eight plus million a year and two plus million a year could pay their kids own way and have their children be walk ons. And somebody said, Swanee, can't you ask that question to Dabo? Yeah, I can, but I'm trying to keep my credentials too, right? I'm I'm hoping you, you gotta hope that somebody from like the New York Times ask a question like that. I can say it on the air, but asking it, I, I don't know. That just that because even if you try to preface that statement by saying, listen, I, I don't really mean anything by this, but if we're talking about roster spots, and this would be the only way I would ever be able to ask it and I uh, feel like maybe they're not going to try to yank the old credential is if I said, look, you know, thinking about roster spots and how important they are and the availability of players in the transfer portal, would it be possible as a head coach to pay for your own children to go to school, thus opening up a couple of roster spots? And again, and this is how I'd have to say it. And now I'm not saying they don't deserve those spots. What I'm asking is, would it not be advantageous to have those spots available? Now, look, you got to turn on your dad ears and you got to hear that from your dad's side. And you have to hear that from the side of a coach who's got a couple of national championships. It'll uh, ha has every reason to say, look, I'm already doing it my way. This is the way I've always done it. And it's never slowed us down from winning national championships. Like you have to be prepared for that to be the answer. If that question is posed. 803-450-0086. 803-450-0086. Benton Zero says, Swanee, do walk-ons have all the access and the same benefits as scholarship players? He says, last I heard, they sometimes don't have access to some of the academic benefits. And that may very well be. But even still, even still, it's not as if with Sweeney or Venables, they couldn't afford academic assistance or tutoring for their own children that they could pay for. Like that that's the thing. Like anything that's accessible. And if it was the belief that there was an access to the same foods or the same uh cow, what else would you say? Like you, you know, everything that's going on at the Reeves Center, I would say, well. No, not really, because those guys are the coach's sons, and probably if they just wanted to walk up, even if they weren't football players, they'd still be able to get their hands on some good grub. So, yeah, I 
you know, I don't know what the answer is per se, but I do think it's worth like keeping your keeping the thought process open of are those available scholarships that could be helping you today? If it is, then why not utilize them? And if it's not, then I'm talking about a point that really has no answer because you Dabo Sweeney would say, I don't think it's all that important. I mean, I don't know what he would say, but I mean, that that's like the thing that he could say where you go, well, yeah, I don't even know why I brought it up. Nick from Georgia says, Sawani, I guess you need to change the intro into the final segment of the show since we apparently can't win. <laughs> yeah. Nick, that's uh, that that intro has been good to us, right? For so many years. We win. And then Clips just went out and won. And now here we are. And all of a sudden, Clemson is not winning at the rate that you would like. And it's like, uh, yeah, that sounds awkward <laughs> at the end of the show. But that's the goal. That's the goal. To go out there and win every single, every single snap. And if you win on every single snap, collectively, you're going to win a whole lot of football games. You're going to win a whole lot of plays. You're going to win a whole lot of drives. You're going to win a whole lot of football games. And I think the focus and the, atten uh, the, the attention, the detail for the, this coaching staff and these players needs to continue to stay amplified at the top because that's where, you know, Dabo Sweeney always, th always says, don't let the light that shines on you shine brighter than the light that shines in you. You also cannot allow the outside influences and the negative the, the negativity that can surround the program to influence you the wrong way either. You have to have a positive perspective and a windshield mentality because you are going to face adversity when you're playing the way Clemson's been playing. And I think in part that has awakened the belief from the opponents that you are a wounded animal, that you can be knocked off. And so instead of cowering and preparing to be punched, they come out swinging. And if they connect, it can stagger a beast like Clemson. Hour two coming up. Stay with us. It's time for Clemson Sports Talk with Lawton Swan. Ready, Just call me Swanee. Tiger style. Tiger style. It is our number two. That's drive time right here on the show that shakes the South Lane Clemson Sports Talk Lawton Swan with you. Tommy Bowden, hour number one. That was incredible. Clemson Tom joins us here in hour number two. Always good to catch up with Clemson Tom. Tom, buddy, thank you for taking time out. Clemson, Florida State, my man. That's always a big one. Uh, this year with the, the, the resumes, maybe not looking so good, but nonetheless, it's still the Tigers and the Seminoles. It is, man, but it's not the Tigers in the Seminoles, though. <laughs> it's 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 not. It's 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 uh it's a shell within themselves. Two teams that the ACC needs to always have their A game, and are just going to bring A game. So it's we'll see what happens. I'm not I'm not looking forward to it. Tom, on a scale of one to ten, ten being uh, the most frustrating thing you can imagine, Swanee, and one being ah, no big deal. I mean, where is this season right now for Clemson fans, or for you specifically at four and three? Well, I'm a little different because I got um, I got some extracurriculars going on uh, with Xander doing uh, golf tournaments every weekend, so mine's a little a little different. However, if you want to rewind the track a little bit and go back. Shoot, let's even go six years or even less. Um, my frustration level wouldn't be a 10. Um, it would be probably a 12. It, it would be pretty frustrating. Mm. Um, 
especially because what we had on paper, what we have on paper, what we're being told constantly isn't, it isn't what it is. It's like going to a high end restaurant and you're like, Oh man, we got these Wagyu beef steaks and the lobsters, we flown them in from Maine today and they're ice cold. And the wine just came in from a vineyard from Northern Italy. And it's going to be the best meal ever. And they, they roll out like something you see at golden crown. You're like, man, what is this? And they pour the wine. It looks like grape juice. Like, whoa, 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 time out, time out, time out. This is, I'm at the wrong. This is not the plate I ordered. <laughs> that's kind of that's kind of how I feel, and like there's been you know that's like, when you complain, where, Tom. Like when you like nobody complains when everything's perfect. But that's but if, if if I'm ordering you know that on the menu, and then you give me what I just described, it, you raise your hand going, whoa, 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 we made a mistake, something happened. And that's how it was at the beginning of the year. We're like, whoa, 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 time out, time out. You know, what, what's wrong? This isn't it. And then every week, we're like, this isn't what we were told. This isn't what we ordered. This isn't, this is, no, 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 no. And then finally, you're like, well, time out. Okay, obviously something's wrong here. And then we're complaining. Um, I can't remember what game it was. It was before the pit game. I think it was Syracuse. And okay. Caitlin goes, what happens if they lose? Are you going to be mad? And I, I blatantly looked at her and said, no, we deserve to lose. We are playing so bad, we don't deserve to win. And we ended up winning. But that's how bad we just look. I mean, we're calling sweet plays to the left, to the right, whatever it is. You got receivers you know, kind of checking the, the defender like they're going to block them, but then they don't block them. So we got that going on. But y'all want to blame Tony. It was, oh, Tony Ellis calling the wrong play. You know, he's calling a play. But then his his players aren't executing it, and then you got players dropping passes, hitting them in the hands, hitting them in the chest. I I got my my star running back freshman, supposed to be a phenom, he's in stride, drops the ball, hits him in the bread basket, drops it. I got receivers in overtime, at an away game to win the game to tie it up to whatever it was at the time, gives up on the play, throws his hands up before even the ball gets to him, trying to get a pass interference play. That's not what I'm used to. But at the same time, we've got uh, a quarterback that doesn't have any camaraderie with his offense. Yeah, everyone's like, what happened to DJ from from Notre Dame? Well, that DJ from Notre Dame had Travis Etienne. He had an offensive line that was functioning. He had wide receivers that knew what they were doing. Everybody around him knew what he was doing. So it it helped him do better. Now, Now, it's not so much. We don't have a true captain on the offense. And Will Shipley even said it this week. He's like, you know, we don't we don't have that guy. And he's like, I'm hope I hope I'm that guy. Well, Will, we hope you're that guy too. But we need someone to step up. There seems to be no leadership on the offense. You know, DJ's dealing with stuff off the field that's been, you know, in the in the media. I'm not gonna gonna touch on, just Google it if you want to. So he's got some stuff going on mentally with him. But at the end of the day, we're just executing. I mean it's it's to the point, man, I just I don't want to just fast forward, win whatever games we want to win, lose whatever we want to lose. Hopefully we beat South Carolina. And let's look at next year. I mean, because this right here, man, it's 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 it's, it's not bad. It's frustrating. Give me a reason that next year Clemson fans should feel good about this team. <sighs> one more year in the system. Yeah, the guys having one more year with each other. But the thing about it is, it's it, I, I get a little insight from here and there, and I know that the NIL has created some egos, and it's the guys are getting a little cocky, they're getting a little arrogant here and there, and I think it's I think it's bad. I think it's eating us up a little bit, and I, I don't feel and I know that there's no true camaraderie in the locker room, and we're missing that. We're missing those dogs, and. These guys are coming in like, oh man, we had Trevor Lawrence, we got the Sean Watson, we had the Tosh Boards, like we're like we're good. They're not good enough to show up and just win. Like even Deshaun, even Trevor, even Taj. Like even shoot, Taj is the prime example. He had to like drag and claw for every win that he had. Just to, I mean, do you remember fourth uh, the, against LSU? Fourth and sixteen. We were yeah. dying. Yes, we were dying to get some kind of Someone please tell us that we've made it. Like we were in, in ESC was like, Hey, 
Clemson. Hey, are they are they for real? And like, heck yeah, we're for real. We were thirsty for national recognition. We, I mean, if if LSU, if ESPN would have been like, we're gonna have a street fight in the parking lot, like Clemson versus LSU. We're like, heck yeah, guys, bow it up. Like our guys would fight for every inch. And then these cats, I just, I just feel like it's just like that TikTok generation, man. Maybe they'll dance on Walker and later, but. You know, push comes to shove. I don't think I don't think they're going to bow their back, and you know, have, it, I, I feel like there's no meanness, man. And it's it, it's sad. It, it really of, is sad. Uh, yeah, it's it's been so strange because you've come, become accustomed to the ball bouncing your way or the big stop being yours, and now it's just not that. And so you're trying to you're trying to figure it out now. We're soft. I'm gonna call it. I'm, you know, so I, it's you and me and the listeners. Yeah, it's just, just me and you, Tom. Show. <laughs> yeah, and, and the listeners, man. And so we can we can we can call it how it is. We're soft, we're like soft. a like That's, a Twinkie not, feeling. Not, not on defense, though. On defense, we're mean. But on offense, yeah, man, it's it's. You know what the offense is blocking? You know what the wide receivers' blockings look like. You ever seen the video of where like a. Uh, a, a college football team will have like the ninety-five-year-old guy, and they hand him the ball um, during like the yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and everybody's just doing that kind of that one touchdown. Yeah, that's what it looks like. <laughs> I'm, I'm not wrong, right? Like a Joe, no, Joe no, and no, Justin you're Ross, they, they've looked awful blocking. No, awful. It's, it's it's sad, dude. It, we're we're soft, like. It's to the point where like I don't even want to talk about it. You I know think I mean? your frustration scale might actually be a twelve, Tom. I think you might be there. You just haven't you you, uh, you just haven't accepted it yet. Maybe maybe because I'm like on my dad level. I'm hearing yeah, I'm like, a twelve. Is, <laughs> because even like when something happens, and I even told I even told Kayla, I was like, you know, I'm not mad. I'm disappointed. So maybe my dad mode's coming out now. Like mm. the old Clemson Tom, where he would be you know angry and like what the you know come on. Quit being girls out there. Now I'm just disappointed. Are you mad at and me, I Dad? Told, no, son. I'm no, disappointed. Disappointed. <laughs> that, that hurts worse. Could you just be mad? It does. <laughs> but I can't be mad because I'm, I'm really – and I am disappointed. I think we all are. Yeah. Every cat on that offensive roster is either a four or a five star. And I'm not saying not everybody on that offense is giving their all. But I'm just saying – most of them aren't giving their all, and it's it's on tape. Look at the plays, and for a team that loves to run a wide receiver screen pass, we can't execute. Um, Tom, I mean, good good lord! I know you like guys that are passionate. Uh, did you get to watch yeah. Matt Bockhorst this week and and his emotional moment? I did. With the, I even I sent. I did. I even sent him a message, and um. I told him, you know, thanks for always giving your all. Thanks for always being a tiger. And uh, especially for guys like that to go out your senior year like this, guys that have been in, that have been in the trenches. And the offensive line has been rough here and there. You got guys playing out of position. And not knocking the offensive line because when you got someone that's coming in to play a guard and you put them on tackle, and it's, you, could, you could mess up. A, you, like, you can't play guard and then switch left tackle or – Play guard and go to right tackle. It's just it's just not there. Or go to center. Like I think we played like three centers this year. Like you just you just can't do that. And um, to hear him, you know, kind of break down. You know the passion is there for these guys. It's just lack of execution. And as on football, it's a team sport. If the ball doesn't get hiked properly, the quarterback can't hand it off properly or can't throw it properly. If we're going to run it and you're not blocking, the play's busted. If we're going to pass it and you're not blocking and you're not running the right routes, the play's busted. And so that's what makes it the ultimate team sport because everyone has to do their job in order for the play to go perfectly. And it unfortunately, it just is what it is for Matt and my heart goes out to him. But, you know, that's just at the end of the day, that's, that's kind of what happens in life. And I feel bad for him. Hope he bounces back at the end of the day. You know, I hope he, hope he just comes back okay. You know, I hope he's able to, to live a, a normal life with his knee and his I mean, I've got injuries that creep upon me all the time. Every time it gets cold, my left knee kind of goes out on me. Um, but <laughs> he's he's a lot younger than me, so he doesn't have to. He's got about twenty more years till that till that happens. But it uh, it 
it hurts when you see a guy kind of break down like that after someone's given their all for three to four years for you. Tom, and now we're number one. We had Clemson, or excuse me, we had Tommy Bowden on the program and former Clemson Tiger head coach. And yeah, he's a guest every week here on Fridays. Mm -hmm. And through my seven, eight years doing this with him, I've grown to just respect him more and more. Um, as a fan, before I was doing radio, oh man, there were days I, I probably have said some things and thought th some things about him that <laughs> I, I can't say on the radio. But I, I do want to say this. Um, he recognizes, you know, no doubt the the I think the mistakes that he made. He he recognizes the the positives that he added to Clemson's program. He's going to be in Death Valley Saturday for the first time since. Uh, being fired and that transition to Dabo Sweeney being the interim head coach as Clemson is going to honor his father's legacy, the late Bobby Bowden. Uh, what kind of reception do you expect Clemson fans to give him after uh, what, I guess, 13 years since he was the head coach? I, I think it's going to be a loud, raucous standing ovation um, because without him, Dabo Sweeney doesn't arrive at Clemson. The West Zone probably isn't there. Uh, there's yep. just a lot of things that he knew his father was doing at Florida State that Clemson needed to do to compete at the highest level. And he, and, you know, I don't know if he would have ever paid it off with a championship if Clemson would have just stuck it out with him. But his hiring of Dabo Sweeney certainly uh, brought Clemson two national titles. Yeah, I think he's going to be a standing ovation. Um, yeah, he had some rough years for us, but every program is going to go through those years. You know, it's, it, you look across the board, everyone's going to be. Like that. I mean, I don't care who you are. Even look at Alabama. They had some rough years. Um, no, it's and not only is it to honor him, but it's also also his father, who was pinnacle for college football. Um, to not give a standing ovation would be a disservice as as a fan um, or anything. Honestly, I mean, you can have whatever feelings you have about his uh, his time at Clemson, but the man deserves a standing ovation. It, it didn't end the way we all wanted to end. He had some ups, he had some downs. We had some good times, though. You know, looking back, man, they were sixty-three they were seventeen over South Carolina, yeah. beating Tennessee. I mean, yeah, you, you had CJ. Uh, oh my gosh, you had touchdown Jesus, uh, clipboard Jesus. I my slip, uh, Whitehurst could slip my name for or slip my mind. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Charlie Whitehurst, sure. I, yeah, Charlie Whitehurst. Yeah, um, we had some fun times. You know, I mean, it wasn't the greatest. It wasn't by far the worst. You know, it wasn't like the Hatfield days. I would, I mean, what, what would Hatfield get? You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, and the other thing too, right? I think what's the old saying that um, time heals time all heals wounds. All wounds. Yeah. But you also recognize, I think too, like no matter how you felt about him at the time, that passion that you have for Clemson, think of the hours that he poured in to to that program. You know what I mean? Like the hours oh, no, he no, spent. No. Yeah, yeah. And the thing with this is, like, I, I mean, if I, if I was going to be there, I would give him a standing ovation. I, I had no ill will. It, that The whole Clemson came from his era. But, I mean, he did the best. It wasn't like he quit on us. It wasn't like it was like a Lane Kiffin at Tennessee. The guy right. gave it his all. It, it, it just didn't work out. You know what I mean? So, I mean, you're going to have that. What are you going to do, boo a player because the guy showed up to practice early for four straight years and it, he just didn't pan out for the player he was? No, you're not going to do that. Um and that's just what he was. I mean, some he, it is what it is. But he deserves every bit of uh, credibility he has. He was a stepping stone to get to where we are, and we have to at least acknowledge that. But he deserves every bit of the fan base clapping, cheering, and, and standing for what he did for us because he didn't hurt us. At the end of the day, he definitely made us better. Clemson Tom with us here on the program. This gave me chills, Tom, when he told me this. I, I don't know if you'll get the same chills. But I said to him, I said, so coach, who all is going to be there from your family? This was earlier in hour number one. And he said, you know, went through the the a uh, couple of names. He said, but the one that's most important to me that's going to be there is Bobby Bowden. And of course, I thought, Ooh. oh, yeah, you know, he's, you know, they're emotional, spiritual, you know, his father's looking down on him, you know, all that stuff. He's actually talking about his grandson, Bobby Bowden. His his son Ryan's uh, son's name is Bobby Bowden, and he's going to be at the game uh, when Clemson honors the legendary Florida State head coach. Did you get? I got I got goosebumps, man. I did <laughs> a little bit just now because I, I didn't know he had a grandson. 
I, they had a Sunday, a great Sunday, Bobby, Bobby Bowden, right? Me either. I didn't know. I, I this is yeah, this is the first for me, man. Um, Dad Gum, you know, in, in true Bowden form. Dad in gum. true Bowden form, a Dad Gum. Dad Gum. Um, wow, Tom, dude, who wins? That it? Is who pretty who cool. wins this game? Help me out, dude. Oh my gosh, I would love to say us, and. I was on I was on an interview yesterday, and I told him take the end because they're like, oh, what's the in bed line? And I'm like, you know, I don't bet on games anymore. But if I was, it would be the under, and I would take Florida State plus ten because even if we win, it ain't gonna be my much. And I don't know what team's gonna show up. I don't I don't know if Puma Chan's gonna go out there and do something. I don't know if DJ's finally gonna you know quit playing like he's playing and just be like I'm DJ Uyungle and. Dad Gummit, I'm good. You know, I don't and when are the receivers gonna quit being selfish and start blocking? When when are they gonna start catching the passes? When is Shipley gonna finally break for that one run? Oh, he's so close, you know, wasn't he? Yeah, right there, dude. You know, it's just I feel like we're like right there. You think Clemson wins but, that game at Pitt if he makes that catch? Yes, hundred percent. I do too. That, like that, that's that, the weird thing, right? Like I think it changed everything. That play changed everything. Um can he catch that? That's a touchdown, Swanee. You're up 14 You know it. I know it. Ain't nobody, ain't nobody going to catch that. Ain't nobody going to catch up for that. And that's a, that's a, that's a, a punch to the gut right there. Yeah, and then and all then of a sudden you're up 14 nothing, and Pitt's going, oh, no, Clemson's Clemson's Clemson again. Or they're like, oh, we got now, now we got to stretch the field. But at the same time, they, they march down the field pretty quickly on it. Yeah. Instead, you so, drop it, and they go, oh, they're still 2021 Clemson. They're a bumbling football team. Yep. Yeah. And then maybe they change up their defensive scheme. Man, who knows? But we dropped a lot of passes that could have gone either for a lot of yardage or mm. for six. But the one to Shipley was six written all over mm. it. I could have caught that. I ain't caught a football in years. I'm not saying I would have scored. I've been saying I would have caught it. But it's it's like stuff like that. That's just the season for us for some reason. We got all the talent in the world, but we just we just can't put it together. It's you know, it's like I feel like a Tesla Model 1. All the hype, but it ain't going for it. New it's, Coke. It's, yes, New Coke. Yeah. Tom, yeah, buddy. New Coke, yeah, or Crystal Clear Pepsi. <laughs> Crystal Clear Pepsi. All right, Tom, <laughs> we'll talk to you next week, my man. Take care, buddy. All right, buddy. Go Tigers. Clubs to Tom here on the show that shakes the Southland. Hour number two of the show that shakes the Southland. Always good to catch up with Clubs to Tom. So, one of the things that we talked about earlier were the running backs, but we, we haven't talked about the quarterback situation. And again, this whole week, you know, the thing coming out of that pit game and, and even with the performance that Tyson Pumachan had, which was good, not great, good, not great, maybe better certainly than, than DJ Uyunglele given the uh, limited number of snaps that Tyson Pumachan got, uh, is the fact that the coaching staff has said, hey, look, all these jobs are up for grabs. And, you know, I was looking over the, the depth chart coming into tomorrow's ball game. And, and one of the things that, you know, I noticed was Kobe Pace was still listed as the starting running back. Well, we know that Kobe Pace is out due to COVID-19 protocol. And so that got me wondering about the quarterback spot. Like on the, the depth chart, DJ is listed as the starter. Uh, but I, I haven't heard anything, and and I don't remember, again, hearing it, that it was absolutely going to be DJ Uyunglele who's starting tomorrow. Like, I, I, I don't remember hearing, and it's, it's possible that I missed it, but I, I did think about, you know, even if, it's still DJ. How many snaps will Tyson get? And did his performance a week ago prove him worthy of some more opportunities? And and even if it didn't per se, I don't see a reason that anything DJ did would limit me from wanting to play Tyson as well again for another weekend. Like, I just think that, you know, you want to continue to grow both of these guys and given where the season is right now, why not go ahead and give Tyson some more opportunities? Because 
there there has to continue to be this possibility no matter what your ranking was coming out of high school no matter how well thought of you are nationally no matter what Vegas and the media believes that you can be you've ultimately still got to go out there and and do the do the work and DJ Uyunglele just hasn't and all of the preseason accolades and the conversations and even what he did a year ago aren't enough any longer to hold water against the tide of give somebody else an opportunity. And right now that feels like, in a lot of respects, what DJ's also up against. Like, it's hard for me to imagine all of the classes and courses and everything he's dealing with off the field with the situation with his parents and certainly uh, the expectations of NIL. Like, I mean, you really are thinking about what DJ has to go through on a day in and day out basis. And that doesn't even include the coursework, um, the classes, the homework, probably a, a relationship, um, you know, with a female companion, you know, girlfriend, whatever who, I mean, really who knows, but I can only imagine how busy you might find yourself if you were the number one quarterback at a program like Clemson, whether you're soaring the number one in the country or, or sort of stinking it up like Clemson is right now, there's still so many obligations and media hits. And now with NIL, probably commercials, and you got to do your classwork, you got to do your homework, you got to be prepared for a test, you got to be prepared for uh, Florida State and your, you know, and your next opponent. I mean, it's just, it's a never ending cycle as it pertains to the weekend and week out grind of being QB one and add to that, how he's played. And I look, it seems like it would just be worse to me. Like I, I know if you play well and you're dominant, you're going to eventually be talked about with Heisman trophies and maybe you're getting interviewed more nationally. And people want to hear what DJ has to say, but either way, to have to manage all that still. And, and, and now, even those conversations aren't positive ones. Like, that's the other thing. Dabo Sweeney could talk about trying to kind of keep some of the negative out of your mind and, and, and focus on the positive. But when you're the quarterback and you're constantly being asked about, hey, what did you see on this play? What were you thinking there? Were you surprised that such and so didn't make this grab? What's up with the offensive line? Like, DJ gets in front of the media every game and 85% of the things he gets asked is about the negative. I mean, DJ's surrounded by negativity simply because of how Clemson's played. He gets asked about those negative things that have gone on with this team in 2021. 803-450-0086, text line, phone line, be a part of the program. Uh, we got our poll question up right now, the Kaufman's fan poll. Go go check out our good friends, Alicia Kaufman Quinton at Kaufman's Meeting Place over in Lexington. The question is, how will Clemson finish in their five final regular season games? Can they go 5-0? and oh? Can they go 4-1? 3-2? 2-3? 1-3? Or 2-3? One and four, or, or or would you dial them up for the dreaded zero and five? We don't even have that on the list. I I don't think they're going to lose to Connecticut. But again, how do you think Clemson will finish in twenty twenty one? Will they go undefeated the rest of the way, sort of like that two thousand and three Clemson team, or will this team continue to struggle and find their way? maybe even to a 500 record, or is there a possibility that they don't even make a bowl game? Again, could they go 5-0? Sure. I'd love to see them get the offense rolling this weekend and make me feel confident 
about thinking that they've got a shot to go 5-0 and over their final five games. But at this point, I'm not even sure if they can go 1-0 and this weekend. Stay with us for more Clemson Sports Talk. Rolling along again, head over to ClemsonSportsTalk.com. A great, great story up. Tommy Bowden on Clemson honoring his father tomorrow, his father's life and legacy. He said, quote, it's going to be an emotional time. Uh, appreciate all of you who shared that and the thousands of people who have viewed it so far. Again, it's got several audio clips for you as well. Uh, but here's one. And again, yesterday we talked with Tim Bray about this, and he talked about the connection between Bobby Bowden, Tommy Bowden, and Dabo Sweeney, and how even though Bobby Bowden had beaten Clemson more than any other coach, the fact that some, in some ways his – legacy ends up helping build Clemson. He may have done as much for Clemson as anybody knowing that his son ended up coming there and then brought in Dabo Sweeney, who has two national titles of his own. I mean, that's the other thing that's kind of crazy that Dabo Sweeney has the same amount of national titles as Bobby Bowden. Bowden was so close so many years and heck Sweeney's been so close for six seasons. Now to winning a couple of more national titles. That being said, Here's what Tommy Bowden had to say about what he saw. And this was, again, we had Tommy on earlier, so you can go go back and hear all that audio. But here's me talking to Tommy Bowden several weeks ago about what it was that he saw from Dabo Sweeney that made him feel comfortable recommending him to Terry Don Phillips to be the next head coach at Clemson. So kind of as a, I'm using some air quotes here, as a CEO of a business, that's kind of where you were in that moment. What what did you see from Dabo Sweeney that gave you just the hunch that he would be what he's become? You know, Lowell, I, I think the fact of the environment I was raised in, uh, being raised uh, in an environment with, a, number one, one of the best coaches in the history of college football, Seeing the intangibles that he had, I'm, I'm talking about my father's personality, sense of humor, ability to say things, ability to recruit, uh, the way he handled staff, or, or around staff, uh, uh, trying to build staff morale. I saw, along with the other aspects, the fact that he was a good Christian guy. His wife, Kathleen, was looked like she would be a great head coach's wife. I think my wife was, my mother was. You know, I, I think I saw the whole ball of wax in my father. My brother, Terry, had been a successful a power five coach. Uh, so I think I had some things to draw on as far as evaluating that a lot of coaches don't have. And I saw all those in, in Dabo and, uh, had put him in a position the year before to, to do some things with the, uh, uh, administration, uh, from an academic standpoint, uh, that, that, that would, would show his skills to decision makers. And, uh, so I, I thought that he had all of those. So when, I, when uh, I left or Terry Don came in and talked to him, I said, you know, this guy's, this guy's got, I told, I remember tell, telling Terry Don, as I explained to you, saying, I think he's got all the ingredients to be a successful head coach. Now, whether he took what I was saying, you know, worth a grain of salt, I don't know, but I, I in getting that environment for so long, I just thought he had all of those things. And obviously Terry Don saw the, the right thing. And some of the administrators are saw the same thing also. So there you go. Tommy Bowden giving some insight into what he saw in Dabo Sweeney uh, with Coach Sweeney on his staff back in 2008 midseason when Clemson decided to make a change. Now, speaking of change, well, tomorrow there'll be a lot of opportunity to change the channel because it is a loaded slate of college football games, uh, beginning with Cincinnati, the number two ranked Bearcats at Tulane. That's a 12 o'clock kickoff on ESPN2. You've also got two undefeated teams in the Big Ten on Fox at noon. And Fox is what they call it, the big game. Michigan's at Michigan State. Uh, You've also got Miami on the road at Pitt. That's a 12 o'clock start on the ACC network in the Atlantic Coast Conference. And uh, last but not least in that 12 o'clock window, perhaps even worthy of or worth tuning in to watch, could be either Iowa and Wisconsin or Texas and Baylor. One of those is on ESPN. I think the Wisconsin game is on ESPN. The Texas game will be on ABC. Moving through your Saturday, Clemson and Florida State kickoff at 3.30. 
on ESPN. But uh, there are some other 330 matchups out there that you might want to catch. How about the world's largest outdoor cocktail party? I know some people don't call it that anymore. I still do. Georgia versus Florida, 330 on CBS. You've also got a Texas Tech kickoff against Oklahoma. The Sooners are favored by 19 and a half at 330 on ABC. Plus, interestingly, when you continue to watch it, Oregon, who's still behind Ohio State, a team they beat in the polls or heads up on the field, Oregon's still behind Ohio State in the polls. Colorado's at Oregon at 330. That game can be found on Fox. Old Miss and Lane Kiffin are on the road at Auburn. The Auburn Tigers, if they can win out, they will actually win the SEC East, 7 o'clock on ESPN. Also, Kentucky's at Mississippi State. That game is at 7 o'clock on the SEC Network. And then in the back half of the day, 7.30 on ABC, you got Penn State on the road in the shoe taking on Ohio State, the fifth-ranked Buckeyes taking on the 20th-ranked Nittany Lions, 7.30 on ABC. North Carolina's at number 11 Notre Dame at 7.30 on Excuse me, that Ohio State game, Penn State game is on ABC. I may have said NBC there. ABC, North Carolina, Notre Dame, 7.30 on NBC. And then Louisville's at NC State at 7.30 on the ACC Network. That's one I think you need Louisville to win if Clemson's going to find a way to uh, have one of those uh, shell games with three teams tied at, with two losses in the league and, and hope to find their way into the ACC championship. You got to begin to believe or hope that both Wake Forest and NC State start picking up some losses. Well, NC State got one last weekend, but more losses are a good thing for Clemson at this point. So that's a quick look at some of the games around the country coming up this Saturday. Of course, the South Carolina Gamecocks, they are on their bye week before taking on uh, Florida next Saturday at 730. 803-450-0086 text line, phone line. My prediction on Clemson and Florida State coming up right here on the show that shakes the Southland on Fox Sports Radio 1400. Also available on Facebook, YouTube, and uh, Twitter. And I hope you are enjoying watching uh, the simulation of that Clemson-Florida State game. We'll hit a quick break. We'll come back with more of the show that shakes the Southland. Plus, my prediction right here. After this, stay with us. What have you done for me lately? It's a fair question. Just don't lose sight of the bigger picture. Don't forget history. Lucky for us at Clemson, the answer to the questions, what have you done for me lately? And what have you done always? Are the same. We win. Final segment on a Friday afternoon again. Old rivals, Clemson and Florida State, squaring off 3.30 tomorrow uh, up in Tigertown. And, you know, the honoring of Bobby Bowden is really, really cool. And there is no doubt that his legacy, again, continues to last uh, in the sport of college football with uh, assistant coaches, former assistant coaches that are out there that are they're still coaching. and. Uh, the fact that his son had such an impact at Clemson uh, by way of an assistant coach named Dabo Sweeney uh, is still uh, a pretty a pretty incredible connection between these two. And it really started back with the Bowden Bowl 1. You know, 1999, Clemson was leading that game 14-3 to at the, bl- the break. Florida State ends up winning at 17-14. Clemson. Has the ball late. That Bowden, that that time, that Bobby Bowden team ends up winning a, a national championship. And you know, it it really did. The Bowden Bowls and the way they were covered and and how many people were there really 
put Clemson back on the the map if for nothing else than just being the place where Tommy Bowden, Bobby Bowden's son, was coaching. And so, looking back on that in those moments, man, anytime these two teams face off, it's a big deal. Like, when I was a kid, being in Death Valley for the punt Ruski game, when I was a kid watching at home when Clemson goes down to Dope Campbell Stadium the following season, you have you have that big uh, Terry Allen run from, what, 73 yards out, and then Wayne Simmons with a 73-yard interception return, and Clemson repays the favor for that, that loss to Florida State the season before in Death Valley. Uh, that, and that point, Ruski play, to me still, and I've done this several times in my career here on the show, the Gene Deckerhoff call of that. 21 21. Oh. Here's the shorthand off. That just gets me. That just gets me someplace. Leroy Butler's got a long way to go to the 40. Leroy Butler at the 30. Leroy at the 20 to the 10. Leroy Butler knocked out of bounds at the four yard line. What a play by the Seminole. Some razzle dazzle. Oh. I could give you the whole thing. I gave you about 95% of it there. If you it, it, give me a it, text me, scale of one to 10. Go listen to the actual Gene Deckerhoff call of it and let me know. How did I do? That has been in my that has been etched in my brain since I was 12 years old. 12 years old. But tomorrow's matchup against the Florida State Seminoles to me still comes down to quarterback play. And I don't care if that quarterback is DJ Uyunglele, Tyson Pumachan, or Joe Schmo from Okimo. Quarterback play is the big key. Do wideouts have to block better downfield for Clemson? Yes. Do players have to do a better job of not dropping passes? Yes. But the quarterback is the straw that stirs the drink for a reason. And right now it's a sour, sour drink. And I just think that if Clemson is going to be the type team that can score over 31 points in a game, DJ's got to be a great football player. Like, everybody knows this is not solely on DJ. But DJ hasn't looked like a confident, great football player. Not at all. Also in attendance tomorrow, perhaps the next great quarterback at Clemson, Obviously, Kate Klubnick coming in, but Arch Manning going to be in attendance for this game against Florida State one week after attending the Ole Miss game. I don't think Clemson will be painting Manning, painting, that sounded like I said Peyton, that painting Manning in the end zone. But I guess technically we could dig up some Manning that, was famous in Clemson's history and and honor them tomorrow. But I, I will say that I think this Clemson team uh, is certainly good enough to beat this Florida State ball club for a couple of reasons. One, yes, Florida State's improved. And yes, they've gotten better rushing the football. But I, I think if that's what you have to live by against this Clemson team, it's going to be a, a long day. now. It shortens the game. Clemson has got to be more consistent on third downs than they have been this entire year. And if they do that, I think Clemson's got a got a chance to maybe win this game by you know fourteen or more points. Florida State's limitations offensively, in, in a lot of respects, hamper them uh, as much as Clemson's issues hamper the Tigers. I still, however, don't buy this Clemson team scoring more than 31 points. So I, But I will take Clemson to win this ball game Saturday. I, I made a prediction yesterday uh, on a Seminole show, and I'm going to stay with a similar result as well. I think Clemson comes out of Death Valley tomorrow with a victory. Clemson, 27, Florida State, 23 
And I think the Seminoles have a chance late, but Clemson's defense stands up like they have the entire season. We got to get out of here until Monday. As always, y'all take care now and go Tigers.